I'm ready for it to be fucking over. And I don't just mean the election cycle, I mean all of it. I'm ready for the sun to just burn us up. They had all the same skepticism of mainstream culture, but it was for a particular goal. Sick! Well, welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And we're going to get into it. Let's go! All right, so for our first segment, we've got the Shitty Minutes. This is where one of us rants about whatever's grinding our gears this week. Austin, it's on you. I mean, this isn't even this week. This is just in this lifetime what's grinding my gears, but it's come to a particular contracted point this week with the post-debate nonsense that has even heightened the media coverage of this charade that we are calling politics in the United States of America. And it just basically has to do with the fact that I'm so fucking bored. I'm so bored with American politics. I'm so bored with the internet. I'm so bored with social media. I'm bored with human beings. I'm just fucking bored. Like, I get it. Trump sells. He does. Trump sells. And he will tell you that he sells. Probably he will inflate how much he sells. But still, he fucking sells. And I get it. And the drama that he brings with him in relation to HRC is um, drama. But that's the thing that is so fucking annoying. I feel like I can't escape high school. Remember how when you're in high school and everyone's like, hey, dude, don't worry. It gets better in college. All that drama shit goes away. That's (laughs) such bullshit, man. It doesn't go away. It got worse in college, especially for us because we went to an evangelical school where the drama just got like... Which which was high school. Yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah. So it doesn't go away. But seriously, it's this weird, ridiculous, manufactured drama that and I don't want to be one of those like conspiracy theorists it's like the media they're just doing this so that they can control the masses for the lizard people who are really in control of everything illuminati it's not that it's that the way the media runs is and the way that quote unquote news outlets run which are now disseminated all throughout the internet so any motherfucker with a blog and the ability to keystroke with his little index fingers is able to create some sort of opinion piece and then drive eyeballs to it. And how do you do that? Well, you use that meme bullshit where you just create some sort of clever tagline that gets eyeballs directed to your site or to your TV channel or to whatever the fuck you want. And then what do you do? You just trump that up, literally. And I'm using that pun on purpose. You trump it up so you can get some fucking manufactured bullshit. It's not manufactured consent. It's manufactured bullshit. And it's just driving me crazy, man. I'm so sick and tired of all of this. And then, of course, TV news outlets do it so that they can sell eyeballs to advertisers so that they can make money from advertising revenues. And it's just driving me crazy, man. I'm just so bored of it. I'm sick of it. I'm ready for it to be fucking over. And I don't just mean the election cycle. I mean all of it. I'm ready for the sun to just burn us up. (laughs) I'm ready for it to be over. Fuck this. Accelerationism. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready, man. Isn't it ridiculous, though? Jesus Christ. You ever heard that uh, Father John Misty song, I'm Bored with the USA? No, but I need to hear it. Yeah. Father John Misty's great, but I think that was a similar sentiment, although he didn't yell it. Mm. Was I yelling? I don't know. I, I kind of feel like you were yelling, for you at least. Yeah. In my heart, I was yelling. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so if you don't like manufactured bullshit, then would organic bullshit be better? Yeah, exactly. I don't know what that looks like, but that sounds more authentic. What is it? What would be organic bullshit? I don't know. Like you just bullshit but in a non-self-aware way. Well, th- I think that's what Trump does, though. He kind of is organic bullshit. Yeah, I think he is. He's, is there some authenticity there? He's an organic piece of shit. Is that what he is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he is a total... I think he's totally authentic, but he's authentic within a paradigm that itself makes him a facade, makes him just a persona, you know? But he's authentic to his simulate or his simulacra, if that makes sense. I can see that. He's more of like a, a symptom than... Than a disease, it feels like. Yeah, yeah, he's the warp. He's not the HPV. He had to go there, didn't he? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Where's the fit? All right, well, sweet. Well, let's move on to our next segment. Um, episode number 10, T Roy. Episode 10. Tizzle. Can you believe we made double digits? Nah, man. I mean, I don't even think I've had a relationship that's lasted this long. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, was that extemporaneous, or did you have that one planned? Uh, no, it's just off the fly, brother. <laughs> 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 All 
Oh, that was great. I mean, I had a couple of things I was going to say, but I'm going to leave it at that because that's perfect. <clears throat> yeah, but that's pretty awesome, man. <laughs> so 10. Well, so uh, for anyone who actually is listening, if you've listened to us for 10 episodes, thank you for sticking with us for 10 episodes. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry for torturing you for 10 episodes. But no. That's a lot of hours, man. It is a lot of hours. Plus, we have all of the, you know, the grueling hours of preparation through the week where we're like, man, what are we going to do? And all of the, the notes that we write and all of that stuff. You mean our WhatsApp messages at Saturday night at 10 p.m.? Yeah, that's, that's what I meant. That's what I was referring to. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think about what our, my students are thinking 10 weeks into the semester after hearing my dastardly voice for all that time. Mm. All the students got to be at that same place, just, just apathetic resignation. Or, I mean, don't they say that after, what is it, six weeks or something like that, that's how long it takes for a habit to get formed, and then after about 10 or 12 weeks... The habit becomes so ingrained that if you don't do it, then you actually feel guilty for not doing it. So maybe what we're doing is we are self, we're causing our audience to self-police themselves with owls at dawn subversion. That's like lots of Foucault shit we talked about last week, right? Yeah. We're using discipline and punish tactics. Yeah. Discipline and Panopticon. Body. Yeah. We know you're listening, but you don't know that we know that you're listening. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so what are we going to talk about this week? Well, we thought, you know, based upon the debate being last week, in one sense, we did not want to talk about the debate because it's stupid and horrible and it deserves only a spot in the shitty minute. And that's really it. Yeah. But at the same time, that's what's in the news this week. Yeah. So we thought, you know, let's talk about something a little bit more left field that that pertains in a more general sense to political discourse that's happening this week. So we thought, you know, there's been lots of talk about cynicism in mm. politics the last few weeks and especially the last week or so and we wanted to talk about you know what what does cynicism actually mean and is it a viable political option today because i know at least from um are you technically a millennial austin yeah, yeah you are yeah yeah i guess it's yeah, it, I, you still are. 1980 they say is the cutoff so i'm an, on the okay. i'm on the older end of the millennial spectrum but yeah still yeah so we're both older millennials compared to the ones that usually get the the tagline of being apathetic and cynical and and, and everything like that, um, and we had to suffer through graduating in the middle of the recession. So I feel like we're exempted from ever being accused of anything mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. our, our cynicism is warranted if we have it. At the same time, what what is this cynicism? Where does it come from? Is there a history to it? Is it effective in any way? Is there a place for it? Silver lining, whatever. Yeah, that could be something we could talk about. Yeah, I'm down with that. And it's so weird, though, because cynicism, it didn't, it didn't always mean this sort of skepticism or, um, I guess, a, a resigned negativity towards the world, which is kind of what it means right now with regards to politics. Like, ah, fuck it. <clears throat> Who cares? You know? Like, the world's going to shit anyway, so I'm just going to do my own thing. That, that didn't really, or, or a sort of, like, negative disposition where it's kind of the unwillingness or inability to see hope or to see positivity in the darkness that didn't that that's didn't. nihilism yeah that's true <laughs> i guess that is not well yeah i guess that is nihilism but the sort of negativity didn't always characterize cynicism because i'm actually really interested in like ancient cynicism you know diogenes masturbating in the street sort of shit like yeah who we should definitely talk about that yeah well do you want to do you want to start with like a historical overview and kind of and in solidarity, we should probably just jack off on the podcast right now. Dude, I, I'm already ahead of you, bro. <laughs> My pants are already up. Whenever I hear your voice, I don't know about the audience, but whenever I hear your voice, I get a little chubby. So, you are a hunk of man, after all. A hunk so, of flesh, as you, you said last week. You are a hunk of week, flesh. Yeah. A hunk of flesh. Um, but yeah, let's talk about Diogenes and the history of cynicism um, back in ancient Greece and where it came from. Yeah, so it's pretty fascinating that the, uh, the ancient Greek cynics were the original, where the term came from, cynicism. And it comes from the Greek word uh, kunikos, which means like like a dog, basically. Hmm. And I guess what the idea was that people called these cynics um, dogs because they used to, uh, they were usually uh, sort of uh, volitional homelessness. Is that what you call it? Chosen homelessness? Yeah. yeah I don't yeah. know what the word is. Yeah, it works. Yeah. And they would live in boxes or in tents or whatever, and they would kill their own food or sometimes even be vegetarians and live with nature. And the, the notion was that this was, you know, it's kind of eschewing cultural norms and the bourgeois culture of Athenian art and poetry and stuff was a way to actually be more fully human and that they actually believed that you could become virtuous in this way. This was like what it means to be a good human being. You can become a better person by detaching yourself. It's kind of a parallel to like a Buddhist 
you know, se- a secession of the wanting, yeah, the desiring that causes suffering. Yeah, really similar. Right? It's kind of that. similar. Yeah. And and this came from sort of like a radicalization of Socrates, right? Yeah, a lot of the um, original cynics kind of saw Socrates' life as the life was the, the example you're supposed to follow more than the, the philosophical questioning. Definite emphasis on virtue. So like reason and rationality played a huge role in, you know, kind of cynic uh, philosophy and ethics, which um, doesn't really play much of a role in, you know, cynicism today. <laughs> no. So there's, you know, they had all the same skepticism of, mainstream culture and um, complaints about or a diagnostic about how that causes the problems of man, of mankind, and all that. Same as you see sometimes today, but it was for a particular goal. It was to become virtuous. And they had a, it was a rough, but there was a theory of virtue and of a life well lived in that philosophy. And, you know, they got called dogs, cynics, because they lived like dogs. And then, you know, Diogenes would go around barking at people (laughs) just to make fun of the fact that they called him a dog. Yeah. So that, that that sounds kind of trollish in the way we'd call it today, right? Yeah. And of course, there's so many famous stories about Diogenes. I mean, you mentioned masturbating in public. That was one of his fondest things. Yeah, I guess, one of my do. favorite things that apparently he said was when, when he was confronted with it, he said, if only I could get rid of my hunger pains by rubbing my belly. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's one, great. Of the, one of the other great anecdotes was um, Alexander the Great came to, came to visit and he was at some conference or something where a bunch of philosophers from Athens and elsewhere had congregated. But Diogenes wasn't there, and Diogenes was famous. And uh, Alexander asks, where is Diogenes? And so they went, they, well, he lives out in this, like, box or whatever outside of town. So they all went there. And Alexander said, Diogenes, um, I wanted to meet you. You know, can I get anything for you? And Diogenes' response was, yeah, can you step out of my sun? Because <laughs> he was blocking the sunlight <laughs> from him. Yeah. And they, I don't know, it's probably apocryphal, right? But it, Alexander is like is so stricken with the, the courage to say that to the most powerful man alive that he yeah. just like loved it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, apparently he was just in general like a staunch critic of Alexander as well. I mean, any sort of power structure, received bits of knowledge, societal expectations. And it was actually, I think it was a jar that he lived in. Like, you know, like one of those big terracotta jars. Like I'm picturing, oh. <laughs> I'm picturing like, uh, what is that, Indiana Jones? Remember how they're like in those big jar things or those like i don't know were they in a jar or was that a basket but whatever like a big big human-sized jar i think is what he lived in i just think of that always sunny episode where charlie lives in a box yeah well that works i just think that's how diogenes so lived Char- charlie is diogenes is he's just a, a brilliant <laughs> fl- here's my question so this is what i've wondered do you think that he was actually crazy or do you think that he was willfully doing this like because i've known I, I, I've known quite a few people that have had, you know, paranoid schizophrenia and stuff like that. I've worked with individuals that have that have dealt with various other, I, I guess we would call it non-neurotypical mental states and individuals who basically just lived in, in their own fantasy worlds. And, you know, you have those moments where you look at them and you're like, dude, maybe this person actually is right. And I'm the crazy one, you know, <laughs> where they're like looking around like everyone's a fed. You're a fed. And I'm like, am I a fed? Maybe, maybe I am a fed. (laughs) Shit, I don't even know. And so you, but you do wonder sometimes. There's a a great story my friend was telling me. He was working with some uh, autistics and he went up to go shake this autistic boy's hand. And the boy said, I'm not shaking your hand. Shaking hands are bullshit. And then he walked away. (laughs) (laughs) And it's kind of like, well, you know what? He's, he's kind of right. Shaking hands hands is is bullshit. bullshit. (laughs) Maybe this dude is just at a different, you know, he just sees the world in a different way. And maybe he's seeing a truth that the rest of us were so pressured by society and those external serial conditions and power structures and whatnot. But individuals who, you know, their brain states function in a different way, maybe they just see a different level of truth. Do you think Diogenes was kind of like today we would just call him crazy? He'd be one of those dudes in downtown Los Angeles pissing in the middle of the street. And I've seen dudes in downtown Los Angeles masturbating in public. So... Do you think that he was just crazy and history has just been charitable and has elevated to him elevated him to this status of ah oh, he was doing this on purpose to try to make a point or do you think the dude was just off his rocker and and we just you know we just don't have the uh enough information or or whatever Yeah it's a, it's a good question right did was he just crazy and then some followers decided to kind of either consciously or unconsciously develop a narrative around him to make him you know like a, a heroic figure yeah. like what's the What's the movie I'm thinking of where uh, everybody interprets some idiot's actions as being like saintly? Was it being there? Uh, yeah, it's being there with um, the Cronenberg film. No, 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 the 1978 film, I think. Uh, the famous comedian Peter Sellers. 
Oh, yeah. From being there. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was the Cronenberg film? What am I thinking of? Didn't he do one called like Being or something? Oh, no, it's Existence. What am I talking about? Oh, Existence. Yeah, yeah. that's very different. Yeah, yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, okay. So Sellers. I've never actually, I've never seen the film. Oh, it's wonderful. You'd love it. Definitely. You'd oh, love it. Okay. Yeah, and you can kind of ask the same thing about Socrates, right? Everything we know about Socrates, other than a few of the poets, is from Plato. And all the poets that write about Socrates make him out to be a bumbling fool. Hmm. Um, but in Plato, he's this just master rhetorician, even though he issues like rhetoric mm -hmm. supposedly right um is it really which one's more accurate mm. i wonder the same thing about jesus then right because a lot of people in the uh first few centuries after jesus they have uh, identified him and, and even people like john dominic crosan and people from the jesus seminar they said that jesus was basically influenced by cynic philosophy and during jesus's time Cynic, cynic philosophy was really was really quite common, and it lasted longer than Stoic philosophy did. Stoic philosophy kind of died out in what, like the second or third century, whereas cynicism or cynic philosophy continued on to like the fourth or fifth century. And uh, it, it did have quite a bit of influence in that world. So maybe there were ways that Jesus was influenced by this sort of cynic lifestyle, the, uh, like you were saying, eschewing of the received ways of how you ought to live in society. And so he was you know, sleeping on people's bed or sleeping on people's floors, so to speak, and getting food from other people and kind of living this uh, austere, ascetic lifestyle. Yeah. The, the thing about the cynics is they didn't really write a whole lot. So we don't have mm. the received tradition, but it had a huge influence on, on even regular people's lives. Whereas stoicism is the opposite, right? It, it was a little bit more highbrow. So even though it was influenced by cynicism, but we have all the, you know, we have lots of writings. You know what? So that makes me wonder survived. how many, because like apparently Diogenes wrote 10 books or something along those lines, but we just, we just don't have them. So all the writings and, or all the things we know about Diogenes are secondhand. So it makes me wonder how many of these influential and maybe important ideas have we lost because of the burning of the library in Alexandria or just because these individuals who taught such amazing things or thought such amazing, amazing things and had such an amazing impact, they didn't write things down because they didn't want to. Because for them, it wasn't about power and it wasn't about the transmission of ideas. It was about this authentic lived existence. Whereas, like you say, the Stoic philosophers, it was much more, I mean, Marcus Aurelius, you don't get much more powerful than Marcus Aurelius, right? So of course mm -hmm. his ideas are going to be written down and passed on. And so it then makes me think about Christianity. If Christianity hadn't ascended to the level of power that it did, would we have lost those writings as well, maybe? Because they would have just been these crazy fringe anarchic writings or anarchist writings from the, these people that were atheists uh, in the Roman Empire who were cannibals and, you know, that they had to be destroyed and, and all of these other various ways that they were viewed. But because then they got co-opted into the power structure, then their ideas were passed on and preserved for history. Amen. Thank God the Muslims saved all those Greek texts. Hey, be careful, man. Don't start talking positive about Muslims. Americans are going to get angry with you. <laughs> I know. By the way, uh, if you are listening to this and you don't know much about Muslim history, you should really check out like the writings of Avicenna and Averroes, who are two of the most important thinkers in the history of the Western world, and they're Muslim thinkers. So, And if you're a Christian and you're interested in the history of Christian theology, you should think about how much Muslim philosophy and Muslim theology actually influenced someone like Thomas Aquinas. So definitely check that shit out. And of course they did like develop, like develop math and medicine and shit like science. That. Yeah. And science, bath, science, <laughs> yeah. medicine, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> philosophy, everything. Now, was and the, they did it in like what, 300 years from the death of Muhammad to the apex of Muslim scholarship. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty impressive shit, man. Um, now did they have a cynic tradition with a Sufi would Sufi Islam sort of be a sort of yeah. cynic tradition. I, I bet the drunken Sufis are kind of like a cynic. I tell people, tradition, tell right? people a little bit about what Sufism is. Yeah, so Sufism was like this. Um, it's hard to, to actually tag. I think when it actually started, because it's not really a movement. It almost can't be structurally speaking. But um, it's this Muslim tradition of kind of ascetic wanderers who would reject the more political and social uh, bedrock of 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 Islam, and would focus on experience alone. And so it was like a oneness with Allah hmm. and the experience of that love. I mean, the, the most famous Sufi ever is Rumi, right? Hmm. You've probably seen somebody post uh, quotes from Rumi on your Facebook wall and you're like, wow, that's really, sounds like someone wrote that in high school um, to their <laughs> first girlfriend. 
but uh no i'm i'm not dissing Rumi. i'm sure it's great if you love that kind of thing yeah but it's just it's, very it's sentimental very and romantic extremely so yeah <laughs> but that's that's not what all sufism is like you know there's lots of different kinds depending upon how one experiences it but it's so interesting because it's the exact opposite of the, almost the entire history of islam hmm. and just shows the the incredible breadth and variety you can have from the exact same sources like they talk about paradise and but they want it now hmm. they don't want to wait till later so that experience of paradise comes in the middle of your current life and you don't have to hmm. be in society and you don't have to in some cases even follow the you know the five pillars or anything right. it's just your experience with god and that's it hmm. the thing is though i wonder there are some similarities there with, with greek cynicism but it doesn't have the the kind of critical aspects like it, it rejects the whole cultural thing but then it moves away from all that and doesn't continue the critical stance i feel like right now what about within the christian tradition would the sort of more extreme like monastic sects would they be considered cynics in a, in a way would they have a an attachment to greek cynicism i don't know what you're thinking well i'm thinking i'm thinking that in some ways there's like a disposition like a cynical disposition in in the ancient sense and it's a disposition of rejection of attachments to the world, right? In a sort of like you made the comparison with Buddhism. And I think that that's pretty accurate. And I think that when you get individuals that are sort of like the Christian mystics who completely separated themselves, like individuals like Meister Eckhart, who wanted that immediate union with God, which is very similar to Sufism and Islam, right? And it's this mystic sort of experience with God now. You sort of do have a, a cynical disposition in, in the ancient sense. And it isn't that all of the points are necessarily the same, but it's this idea of that there's an expectation from the world or from culture, and your disposition is one of rejection. And the rejection might manifest itself positively in different ways, but the negative disposition is something that persists throughout these various different manifestations. So like today's cynics in the Greek sense wouldn't necessarily be individuals who are masturbating in public, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, but it would be individuals who are just at the very least have that initial negative disposition towards the external pressures of how you're supposed to live and how you're supposed to speak and how you're supposed to be a social civilized human. And then what that positively looks like with regards to how you how you embody that cynicism in a positive sense might be different. Does that make sense? No, totally. I mean, it's this foundation of being both critical of the kind of bourgeois culture because the reason is it makes you less human, right? Or it sort of short circuits you before you can become fully human. And then you reject that and you move and you kind of move across the middleman and get directly to that humanness or that flourishing and that flourishing is going to look really weird to mainstream culture because and, and dog-like which is why they're called cynics right. because it's not using the typical means like my favorite example i think would be tom waits is kind of a cynic hmm. in that in musical culture he he rejects ever allowing his songs to be used for commercials and he's had to sue a bunch of different people for illegally using his songs <laughs> he never lets any of his art be used for anything other than he wants especially in the 80s, he would purposefully use like trash cans and guitars that he broke and then rebuilt himself haphazardly just because they sounded cool that way. Mm. And that's just to make, and his voice obviously is not exactly the most pleasing on the first sight or first listen. And all that stuff is, it's very cynical. It's very dog-like when you first get to it. Mm. But then when you really immerse yourself into it, into the life and the creativity and originality, it becomes beautiful and you kind of feel like, you know, I didn't need to have the overproduced um, synthetic stuff that you get on the radio. This is so much better. It's mm. more fully realized and human because of this. And that's, that's cynicism, right? Yeah. So then, so then it's almost that, how to put it, it's almost like as, as long as you have that critical distancing from broader culture, then you're kind of placing yourself sort of within a, a, the cynical tradition. Yeah, it's at least a necessary but not sufficient condition, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So then what would make it more, and what would be the sufficient conditions, you think? Well, I think to get to that discussion, we could ask, is the modern troll, the people who we call cynics today, are they cynics, really? Mm -hmm. and it seems like they have that 
at least a piece of that one necessary condition, the critical distance. When you post a meme that sort of satirizes the political discourse and and whatever, or you troll somebody who's being overly overly self serious, right? Um, just to kind of bring them down a notch. Um, you post first on a YouTube comment thread, just on a very serious <laughs> video or whatever, just to kind of bring it down a notch. Yeah. That's all that critical, cynical distance, right? But then is it directed towards anywhere? Is there any notion of what virtuous life looks like apart from that? Mm. I feel like there's not. Mm. And that seems like the other half of the story that you need to have. Otherwise, you're just nihilism. You're just resignation. Give up on the whole thing. Burn it down. Right. Well, do you think that they do, like, uh, and you're going to drag me into this 4chan conversation, I feel like, because uh, this <laughs> the, the trolling has already happened. So I know I said last week, don't talk about 4chan, but that shit's going to happen. So 4chan has that, that message board that is the poll message board, right? Which actually I think stands for politically incorrect, but it's a bunch of individuals who are posting these fucking memes and, and just kind of, you know, nasty trolly kind of shit right and you're completely anonymized so you can say whatever you want and you have full i guess impunity <laughs> yeah you know there's there's no recourse really and what i wonder is is do such individuals have a sort of positive virtue that they do want to see they're just not advertising it and it would be i mean whatever it is if they genuinely if it's the alt-right then it has to do with whatever the sort of moral program or ethical program or prescriptions would follow from within that paradigm. So the trolling is the sort of negative moment, whereas the sort of positive ascription is the alt-right idea of what society should be like, whatever the fuck that is. I mean, I'm sure for some, yeah, but I feel like most of the, the, the you know, quote-unquote internets, so the people that you would ascribe to, you know, being part of that troll culture and most of the people on 4chan, I, I obviously am not conversant in that, so I don't want to speak in generalizing terms, but I know some people who are involved in that kind of culture. And the sense I get from the vast majority of them is they're, they really honestly feel like there's nothing to believe in or worth believing in in political discourse, let alone mainstream American culture in general. And the only response that we should have to that, morally speaking, is to just lambast it, mm. just wreck shit. And I get that. Yeah. Like when you when you're overly, you know, self serious about everything, that's how you end up with Hillary Clinton as your nominee for the Democratic Party. Hmm. Um, and that's and I get why people would see that and be like, This is this is just re enshrining everything we hate about the system and I I'm not gonna like devote myself to that. I get it. I fully understand that position and I sympathize with it and I get why you'd want to respond to that by making fun of it. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to, to satirize. Hmm. Um, to bring things down a notch that consider themselves to be too high and mighty, right? Kind of like the Andy Kaufman stance. Right. Uh, it doesn't have to have a message interwoven in it to be effective at, you know, showing that the emperor has no clothes. Like that, that all makes sense to me. But then I feel like they're to be to fully encompass that that cynical uh, virtue. You have to have some notion of of what the good life is after that. And I don't think most of those people are really, you know, alt writers. When you get down to it, I don't think they're really like white supremacists. That's just a way of shocking people because all those symbols are just, they're symbols. They don't really mean anything. Right. Right. And so that's part of the, the whole satirization campaign, right? Is to use symbols to shock people because it's so easy. Yeah. Well, okay. So what's the difference between the the trollers who are just trying to lambaste culture and then someone like Foucault who was a sort of rigorous critic, but didn't really have too much to say by way of the positive virtues until later in his life when he talks more about the care of the self and technology of the self. And, and in History of Sexuality, he talks about how sex is used to, as an action that, that, that recreates the self. And, but, but from his more earlier stuff, the archaeological and genealogical stuff, and, and various other critical theorists that were very within the sort of leftist tradition that are very hesitant to create these positive images post Soviet Union because they're afraid of totalitarian uh, or or uh, other sort of dominant power structures emerging, so it's just much more about the negative distancing. Is that is that kind of are they just trolls? 
they just historical theoretical trolls or is there a difference there and, and i mean I'm, i know there is a difference but i mean what, what do we think about what those differences are that's a good question i mean at least at the very least you, you have to argue that foucault was grasping for that thing um there was no sense in which you he's he burn it down right um so that's clearly different i mean there's a reason why you know the kind of um media or what would you call it fictional hero of a lot of the the trolls is joker from dark knight because he just wants to burn it down to prove a point right, right. that it's that the whole thing's manufactured that it can easily be brought down if you stop believing in it mm. and so let's just do it let's just light fire to billions of dollars because who gives a shit and that's clearly different than like carefully dissecting exactly how this system is manufactured but do you need that positive vision to escape being a troll what do you think i'm thinking mr robot right now you know in season two how they have it set up where they have what is it like four million dollars or something like that that's brought to this drop point and then the, the guy from e corp uh is standing there and then he's ordered to burn the money and you're like oh yeah fuck it and then and immediately that image reminded me of the Joker in the Dark Knight, right, where they just got that mound of cash and they light it on fire. But the difference was is in Mr. Robot, the crew, F Society, have a point. And they do have something that they're trying to do. They're trying to build a better world. And as much as Elliot might seem like an individual who doesn't care about the world, some of my favorite sequences are those dream sequences where it's him picturing the potential of that future world, you know, where they're in the streets of New York and he's at that big Thanksgiving dinner and all of his family and friends are there and there's that empty seat where he's talking to the audience and he's like, maybe you'll even be there. I mean, that shit's beautiful and it shows you that underneath his radical, negative, sort of anarchist bent that there is this positive thing. And I mean, personally, if I have a problem with the troll culture, there are many reasons why, but one of the big ones would be precisely that, is that there is no optimism. And there is no hope and that there is no genuine desire to actually make the world a better place. They're just content to be negative fucks. And that to me is, it just gross. I don't know, it bugs me. I, I literally, sometimes I just sit there like someone like, like Mayo Yiannopoulos or something like that, who just seems to be like he's trolling the world. I'm just like, dude, you are just, he's just a facade. And I think there's something interesting. I'm glad the world has someone like him in some ways, just because it creates a point from which we can distance ourselves <laughs> but at the same time i look at him and i'm like dude you are just he just seems so negative to me like he seems so angry and bitter and scared and i wonder i'm like what is it what is it that you're afraid of what is it that you're bitter about what is it that you're resentful towards and those are the things that i'm interested in tackling so you want to be dr freud basically yeah <laughs> yeah i'm down with that no i'm glad you brought up mr robot because I, I totally agree that my favorite part about elliot isn't the, the hacking skills and the, the crazy shit that he does or even his weird personality. It's the fact that underneath it all, he really actually wants to help people. Right. And he honestly believes this is the best way to do it. That's what drives him right. towards the hack in the first place. And that gets brought back out again in that second season when when Craig Robinson's character shows him that you know Silk Road website that he's running. Mm. And Elliot's like, shit, man, I, whatever else is going on, I got to stop this. Right. There are, like, there are girls being you know, trafficked yes. um, through this guy's work. And I, that needs to stop. And I have the capability of stopping it. So whatever danger that puts me in, I have to do it. Or I'm, you know, I'm, I have a moral duty to do that. And I love that that drives him. Hmm. Um, makes his character much more sympathizable than, you know, someone who's so introverted and, and nuts would normally be. And that, yeah, I, I agree. That seems to be lacking, at least in the public face of this but I'm not sure that it, that it, it's going to be lacking when you get privately, you know, it, as much as I'm the cynic and you're supposed to be the, you know, the one who believes in optimism and hope and everything hmm. of the two of us. I still want to think that basically everybody, unless they've just been destroyed by life or whatever, has some core where they care about other people and want a better world. And maybe that's you know, embarrassing to admit in public. And so that's why trolling comes out and, you can come up with all sorts of psychobabble that explains that stuff, right? But harnessing that and using that to actually try to think of a positive vision. You don't have to have an exact vision. Like, I don't think anybody thinks that Dajny's, you know, conception of, you know, the oneness with nature and masturbating in public or whatever is like the virtuous life. Right. But at the very least, he's grasping for that. Mm. Like, he wants to find that outside of 
mainstream culture, which is clearly not giving that and not offering that in any, mm. in any way. So at least the grasping needs to be there. There needs to be some notion of, hey, we're not just bullshitting for the sake of it or because it's fun. That's just like nihilistic play. Mm. Let's actually try to, you know, bullshit, but with a clear intent of, hey, maybe we'll find something in this bullshitting around that actually has some meaning to it and then run with it. Exactly. I mean, I don't want to talk about it too much because I think we're probably going to save it for a future episode, but there is a book. It was written by a couple of scholars in London. One of the guys is Canadian. One of the guys is from London, but it's called Inventing the Future. And in the book, they talk about one of the reasons that the left has failed. And and then they sort of look at the right and they talk about how the right was successful and what the, the right did, especially with the ascendancy of neoliberal economic theory and whatnot. And then they talk about, okay, what the left can learn then from looking at the right successes. And it's, it's a really amazing book. Check it out, Inventing the Future. As a matter of fact, I'm working on a documentary adaptation of it right now. So, you know, in the next year or so, hopefully that'll be done too. So keep your eyes out for that. She it. But um, God, that just makes it sound like I got so much work on my plate. I don't know how I'm going to do it all. <laughs> anyway, um, in the book, one of the things that they talk about that's so interesting from my perspective and that touches on what you just said was the idea of inventing future images that will perpetually enable us to sort of be stimulated in the moment. They call them hyperstitions, which are these big images that are kind of empty placeholders that themselves aren't permanent in any way. So you can look at the future image. You can say, ah, we want the communist society where, you know, uh, everyone is sharing goods and there is no private property and things like that. But then it's like, well, yeah, but maybe as we start to move towards that direction, the image itself changes. But the point is, is creating these images that will affect us in the present so that we will actually transform our present material conditions and overcome the inequalities and injustices that face us and that condition our social lives. And then, of course, you perpetually do that. You reorder and you transform these future images, these hyperstitions. And I think there's something really lovely about that, that you don't have to have a fixed end goal. This isn't, this isn't like some sort of teleological, that's the end goal, that's fixed, everyone must subsume themselves under this image, and we know what's right. It's this idea that it's this collective effort, this egalitarian effort, that we're trying to get as many people involved as possible to create and then recreate these future images, and as we're aiming towards these future images, we're also aware of our present mistakes in the present in creating those future images, realizing that maybe those future images aren't inclusive enough or they aren't based on a proper analysis. And so as more information uh, becomes revealed and as more individuals become a part of the movement and as we become more inclusive and more egalitarian, then the images themselves change. And so we change the images as we change ourselves. And as a matter of fact, creating the images does change ourselves and vice versa. And so there's this constant two-way or dialectical relationship between the perpetual creating of these images and the perpetual recreation of ourselves. And I think that's something that's beautiful. And people get so scared. They ask me all the time. They're like, well, if you don't believe in, uh, if you're not Republican and you're not a Democrat, then what do you want in the world? And there's this accusatory tone that's like, well, if you don't choose one of these two things, what, what do you think is the proper way that the world should be structured? And I generally go into a... a I, I kind of have to qualify things, and it's kind of like, look, bottom line is I just want a world where people work cooperatively together, where there is inju or where there is justice, where um, everyone is taken care of, where people aren't suffering, et cetera, et cetera. I said, what does that exactly look like? I don't know. I said, I have some ideas of what I think will get us moving in that direction. I said, but those things are really secondary. I think more than anything, I just want to commit myself initially to the vision of justice and equality and uh, cooperative work and taking care of the world and taking care of our resources and those sorts of things. Um, but yeah. yeah I'm... You, you don't just say hashtag full communism? <laughs> yeah, well, no, post-capitalism, brother. Come on. No, I thought that was the idea. Yeah. No, no, no <laughs> I, I like that. And I'm, I'm just going to preamble really quick. Mm -hmm. You're going to like the, the metaphor that I'm about to use, I think. Okay. It's purpose directly to make you feel good. I'm ready. Um, that, that structure you're talking about where you have this kind of almost daydreamy ideal yeah and then in working towards it it solidifies and changes and then that it process itself changes you yes same time there's that that relationship um that sort of symbiotic relationship between you and the idea we call that art mm. that's what art is Hallelujah. Right? you have an you have an idea in your mind and it's it's hazy and it's it's not formed well and all that but it's there and it 
by itself, it stokes your imagination. It stokes your motivation, right? It gets your willpower uh, going. And so you work towards it and then you fully realize it in the process of making it. Um, and it has meaning in and of itself. It doesn't have to be instrumental in any way mm. and all that. And then, you know, eventually when you find, you achieve it and you finish it, it's maybe totally different than it was in the beginning as the idea in your head, but it still is the proper thing, right? It has some logic in and of itself that drives you. You know, artists always talk about the muse mm. as being that thing that somehow just drops the ideas in your mind. And then you know, the motivation that's built through working for it, it's just like a natural drive that humans have to create, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not belittling politics to say that we can have that same structure. It's more like saying, hey, creation is what being human really is. Yes. Um, whether it's in the form of, of individual artistic process or in the cooperative political process, uh, they're both really important. And you can have that, that same process there, right? I, I fully agree. I mean, obviously, the title of my PhD research, Creating Society as a Work of Art. <laughs> Thank you, brother. That's I why I said it. I know. I know. <laughs> Creating society as a work of art. And and that was that has been something that has been heavy on my heart for a long time. Because I, I tend to think that fuck, if I do anything, if I go out outside right now and I piss on the wall, I mean, in some ways there is like an artistic expression in that. I know, it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> I do think so though. It it and it obviously is. What are you, like, Damien Hurst? Well, yeah. <laughs> you, you know it, baby. Um if unfortunately it'll evaporate. So it'll go away. So there's a limited time where you can check out my piss art. But um, but I, I think that anything a human does, any sort of expression of human activity, which is something you can't help but do, whether you're sitting there just thinking about something or you're sitting there and you're getting up and going to the refrigerator and making a sandwich, you are creating something. Now, of course, there are degrees of artistic creation. I'm not saying that building a sandwich is the same as, you know, making the statue of David. But um, the point is, is that it is almost this, if there is such a thing as a human nature, which I don't necessarily agree with, if there is something as a human function or a, a sort of necessary expression of human activity, it is this idea of creation. And so I love the idea of intentionally taking that and intentionally focusing that on politics and society and culture and religion and whatever else, or post-religion and post-politics, whatever the fuck term you want to use. I love that idea. That's fucking beautiful, man. And I just have to say, you totally stimulated my mind last week with talking about how I was that Chris character from Into the Wild. So I watched Into the Wild the other night, <laughs> and this conversation totally fits with that man about his like withdrawal and trying to seek that authenticity and, and going into the wild and eschewing the comforts of the world. And he has that bit with Vince Vaughn where they're in the bar and they're just talking about society, Ugh, society, get away from society. And... Um, it's got and he fails, right? He, he does fails. Fail. He it's, does. Fail. It's not successful. No, but it's kind of a pyrrhic victory in the sense that at least he recognized the issue, right? The problem, right? Well, and here's the thing. It, exactly, he does fail because he dies. But one of the things he has this conversation with this older gentleman towards the end of the movie, and it's this older guy who's lonely, who's lost his family, and he sort of befriends Chris, and and at one point he actually asks Chris if he can adopt him, and it's a really touching kind of. Uh, it's, plot point within within the movie and Chris basically says no he's like hey can we talk about this when I get back from my great Alaskan adventure because he's going to go to Alaska and completely be by himself totally alone and that's what he wants right and he talks with this older gentleman and he says and I don't remember exactly so I'm paraphrasing it's something like if you find meaning in human relationships then then that's really sad and tragic because God has basically allowed us to find ultimate meaning in everything it's all around us in this sort of romantic Lord Byron Wordsworth kind of sense, right? Like the moon is beautiful and the sand is beautiful and and that God has placed himself in all of that. And that's where we can find the ultimate meaning. We don't need human relationships to find ultimate meaning. And part of the reason is because Chris has been burned by his family and he is, and then part of the reason is because he's got this intellectual tradition where he's been studying and whatnot and he's become very critical of culture or society. And one of the things I thought about, I was like, look, I, I totally vibe with this guy on so many levels about the idea of the beauty of nature and the idea of um, kind of this trying to find this authentic beauty within the world. But the one thing I don't agree with is I don't think that it's apart from human relationships. I actually tend to think the complete opposite. I tend to think that it's all about human relationships. 
and that it's all about connection. That doesn't mean it's only, I, I shouldn't say all, because that's exclusionary, right? I, it, so it's not only, but it's absolutely about connection with human relationships. And I do think you can find those things in amongst the trees and in the wild and with the bears as they're you know, hunting for salmon. And I think you can find those connections there. But I don't think you do that as human beings. I don't think we ought to do that to the exclusion of culture and society. And that's my only beef is that if you are going to have that sort of cynical wanting to get back in touch with nature, that's amazing. But human beings and human culture in cities, that is nature. It's just a different type of nature. It's a different expression of nature. Okay, so via the transitive property, okay. I'm going to sum up your argument here, mm -hmm. including the, the, the piss wall art <laughs> and being one with nature but with other people mm -hmm. and say that Austin is basically saying to you, the listeners, that the most authentic life you can live is to all go outside and masturbate together in public. Actually, I thought you were going to go like R. Kelly status and be like, Austin thinks that we should just piss on each other. And that is the ultimate expression of creation and art. I kind of, I kind of like the idea of mass masturbation because it would be <laughs> M-A-S-S -S turbation. Ooh, that's an Hashtag art project. mass dude, that turbation. Is a, you know, dude, that's a fucking art project. You know some wanky like <laughs> avant-garde artist is like, I got it. I got it. Ancient cynicism, mass turbation. <laughs> All right, sweet. Well, once we finish our masturbation, then we can all come and we can reflect about meaning in the world. And uh, that's, does that fit at all? I don't, or am I just grasping at straws now? You're grasping at something. I'm grasping at something. Um, but yeah, so now we are going to go to the segment of the episode where one of us talks about what is giving us meaning in a world that is oftentimes devoid of meaning. And this week, Troy has the sticky leaves. So, Troy, what is your sticky leaves or leaf or whatever for this week? I was thinking you were going to make a joke about sticky leaves. Like, how did they get sticky? It's <laughs> from all that masturbation. <laughs> well, it's possible. How many times can you say the word masturbation on a podcast before people stop listening? Uh, I don't know. Want to try? We're it? testing that hypothesis right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what the, uh, so viewer, my... the viewer uh, numbers were for this week. My sticky leaves this week is going to be pretty simple. There's no conspiratorial plot from the 5th century about Neoplatonic paganism surviving through the centuries or anything. Uh, real simply this week, I want to talk to you about who I believe the two Don Quixotes of our time are, at least in the music world. Hmm. Um, there's two artists that have recently released albums that I would call both quixotic in a certain way, but in, in, in many ways polarized ways. Uh, the first of those is Jay Maskus, who's the guitarist and frontman of Dinosaur Jr., one of my favorite bands of all time. He is my favorite guitarist of all time. He's an extremely uh, iconic figure. He never talks, hardly ever. Hmm. Uh, when he talks, he talks in like the most stunted uh, monosyllabolic terms. Um, just go listen to an interview with him on YouTube. It's hilarious. I, I was watching the other day Pitchfork, uh, may they uh, die in less than peace was doing an interview with with the band dinosaur jr and they're asking them random questions just about just whatever um, they like to do that and they asked the band what do you think about el chapo and jay mascus's response was i don't know him personally <laughs> that was it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was wonderful. All of his interview answers are wonderful. I was telling somebody, one of my friends, that you know, a, a show called Jay Mascus Says Words would be a show that I would watch religiously because it'd be wonderful. <laughs> um, but anyway, he he has this this persona that's so reserved, and um, seems like he kind of doesn't like the world and isn't interested in the world at all. And he even sings like that. He's very just lazy delivery. Like he just doesn't have a, give a shit about anything. But then when he goes into guitar parts, it just explodes with fury. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think of it like he plays guitar like he's trying to catch a chicken. Mm -hmm. He's only kind of controlling the chaos. He can't actually hold it. Like, you know, a lot of people talk about maybe like a, the great blues and early rock guitarists like Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and, and all them, uh, Jimmy Page, that they they have expressive guitar styles, right? 
you can feel the the inner flower within them coming out. Whereas, and that's that's great and all, but I feel like an even cooler metaphor for where like Jay plays is, it's like a fire, and you're trying to just stop it from spreading. And so you're kind of controlling or managing the chaos, but you can't ever actually grasp it fully. It's almost out of your control. You're just reining it in. I love that because it's it just, I don't know, just the metaphor speaks to me a little bit more. Mm. Um, and he plays guitar like that. And the new album, even though they've been around for 30 years, the band is is really good. It's not up there with our great stuff from the 80s, but it's it's wonderful. In counterposition to that is the new Danny Brown album, mm-hmm. which is, have you listened to it? Oh, yeah, dude. It, I've, it's been on repeat constant oh my god it's so good <laughs> yeah i mean I, I love danny brown i've loved them since uh 30 or triple x whatever you call it came out um old his second album was, was really good but it wasn't quite the huge step forward i was hoping for but man this this new one atrocity exhibition is everything hmm. i mean it's it's unlike any hip-hop album you'll ever hear and i'm not even a hip-hop head so i, I can't speak to that but i bet you anything if if mike's going to talk about this this week he's going to say something similar about this is just, I don't even know what this is. Yeah. I don't even know what it is hip hop anymore. It, he's, yeah. <laughs> it, it's something. Yeah. I'm I mean, like, I, like, I'm even less of a hip hop head, you know, than you are. And, um, I think it's fucking brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I, if this makes any sense, I don't want to in, cut into your sticky leaves here real quick, but I, um, I've been listening to it as I've been reading and researching. And it's almost like, because it's so chaotic that my mind doesn't have the ability to wander because I've got Danny Brown's chaos that is because I'm very scatterbrained as it is and I've got his chaos that is occupying my attention and I'm actually able to focus so I've been able to read like intense philosophy while I've got Danny Brown blasting in my head if that makes any sense at all I, I don't know why it's working but it's been working this week yeah very much so and it's, it's you feel like something important and weird is happening you don't really know what it is hmm. I feel like the way we're talking about it right now I'm not even sure what the album is, but I know that it's great. And I know that in two months and in two years and in 20 years, I'm going to see the album completely differently. Mm. And it'll still be great, though, which is so cool to think about how it's going to change over time just because I'm going to have a better grasp of, of the album itself and the way it plays in the world and stuff like that. But anyway, Daniel Brown is it's similarly quixotic. I mean, but in the opposite way of Jay Mascus. I mean, he's constantly talking and he's all over the place. And he's he's scatterbrained, but he he kind of reins that all in into a way that makes it palpable. Just go listen to interviews of him. Mm-hmm. Dude is hilarious. Oh my god. <laughs> he has the funniest voice you've ever heard in your life. He speaks a mile a minute. He makes allusions to things and you're not even sure where that came from or what he's saying. <laughs> he's yeah, he's amazing. Uh and they're both these really interesting figures that are doing art and music that's that's totally left field in certain ways and original and unique to them and then and entirely an expression of their personalities and ways of viewing the world mm. and it's the opposite of mine i'm not like that at all i'm super mundane and boring compared to them but i i love living vicariously through them mm. and their music it's funny you've talked about dinosaur jr for years and i have never even listened to a song i gotta do that now I gotta do that now. I'm gonna go listen to some fucking Dinosaur Junior stuff, but I've because it's an acquired taste. Is for it for sure? Well, are they like they're, yeah, they're kind of like post punk or something, right? Yeah, they're part of that '80s indie underground, okay. um, like with Sonic Youth and okay, uh, you know, bands like that. Um, so if you don't like that stuff, you're probably not gonna like it. But I would say listen to it if you're gonna listen to Dinosaur Junior. Anybody out there? Go to the album "You're Living All Over Me," which is a great name for an album that apparently Jay said to somebody when they were on tour. When they were kind of bugging him, he's like, "You're living all over me right now," <laughs> which is great. That. that is brilliant. Um, listen to it as the the dynamic contrast between the incredibly lazy, laid back, don't give a shit about the world vocals and you know verses of the songs, and compare that to the solos, which then explode in fury. And that dynamic contrast is what makes Dinosaur so Junior because you're just going from one polar opposite to the the other side um, and I love any kind of art it needs to have that dynamic contrast to really juxtapose these things and compare them contrast them and stuff and make it interesting even a society as you're creating it as a work of art tying it all back in all right so for our next segment we're gonna be doing some bullshitting mm-hmm. 
this week we've decided to bullshit about Oktoberfest because is it because just because it's October? Yeah. Or is Oktoberfest happening right now in Germany? It is happening, but it's been happening for a couple weeks. But it wasn't October. Yeah, it starts it starts in September. See, this is why the world doesn't make any sense to me. I know. This should be really easy. It should be. Just do Oktoberfest in October. How do you mess that up? I don't know, man. I don't know, dude. I know. Maybe maybe it has to do with like the old calendar, you know, like a lunar calendar or something like that. Is the the tenth lunar month? Yeah, I don't previously? know. Previously, yeah, maybe. Maybe I I don't, know. I don't know. All I know is, so I'm presently, obviously, I'm in Scotland, right? And I'm in between residences as I'm preparing to move to Ireland next, maybe next week. I don't know, maybe next week. But I'll be in Dublin next week. And right now, where I'm staying, there is a German woman that lives in this flat, and um, she was telling us she made dinner for us a few, uh, what, like a week and a half ago or something like that, and she made this traditional German dish, and I am going to butcher it if I try to say it. I can't even remember what it was called, but it was fantastic. But we were talking about Oktoberfest, and she was telling me all about it, and I was like, so is it literally – because, you know, as, as an American dude from Southern California, the only people that I've ever known that have gone to Oktoberfest are like – bros that are like i'm just gonna go get fucked up and then they share their pictures on social media or something like that of them wearing their leader hosens or whatever they're called drinking those big ass fucking goblets and she's like no no that's what it is <laughs> that's what it is <laughs> and i was like really and she's like yeah i was like so you guys just drink and she's like yeah and i said well but like how does work get done and she was like well you know the, the germans only go out on the weekends but you know everyone else just floods the streets and it's Everyone's just drinking. And I was like, but like, like, it's just accepted that you're going to be fucked up for a month. And she's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's so crazy, man. I don't know if I could handle it. Do you ever go to like a uh, Oktoberfest when you were growing up? Do they Do, have those in the OC? Yeah. And I've ne I never, ever went. I feel like I missed out. As a matter of fact, when I was living and I've been living in a couple different places, but when I was in England in Nottingham, the castle that was like right around the corner from my flat, um, the Notting the castle in Nottingham, they used to have a big, huge Oktoberfest celebration. And I didn't go. And then since I've been in the UK, you know, off and on for the past few years, I'm always here in the fall. And uh, even when I'm back in Southern California, I'm only in Southern California during the summer and the winter. So I'm always here in the fall. And I never have partaken in an Oktoberfest celebration. And I feel like before I die, I have to, you know, especially for someone who likes beer as much as I do. Yeah, it's one thing I, you know, I grew up going to Oktoberfest uh, celebrations that we had in the San Fernando Valley all the time. Really? And I, I have some fond memories and I kind of like it. I think part of it's just I love October. Mm. Fall is like my favorite season. I love when it cools down and the um, the leaves change or they catch on fire either way. Um, <laughs> yeah, where you I was going to say, in, in Southern California, they catch on fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I kind of like the idea of redeeming the practice of public day drinking mm. like public day drinking gets such a bad rap because only like weird smelly homeless people do it and then it's like you're not allowed to do that because then what if you're like that and it's like it just gets a bad rap being illegal and you gotta you gotta carry it in a brown paper bag yeah and like if you do that it's okay no one's gonna bother you about it but then it's all embarrassing because you have it in a brown paper bag. Yeah. Um, it's like masturbating in public. Yeah, that That's still like, you know, gratuitous and kind of gross, right? But public <laughs> day drinking can be a totally innocuous and actually kind of socially beneficent practice, I feel yeah. like. In the sense that, you know, it, it's if you're walking and you're going places while you're drinking, at least, you know, sauntering about or standing up, you're not going to get plastered. I mean, first of all, don't drink like Bud Light or whatever. Right drink actual beer, actual Oktoberfest beer, it's not going to have the highest alcohol content. And it's not going to have, you're not going to be able to drink seven of them in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to die. I what? I can't do that. So it just kind of livens up your spirit a little bit. And you're with people. Obviously, you should be with people. That's the, kind of the point of the fest, yes. right? Um, that's that's kind of great. That's the so. classical Greek notion of the symposium and alcohol livening up the party a little bit and just setting your stopping you from being so incredibly self-aware mm. about everything you're doing which is you know i mean it's not physically healthy to ingest alcohol ever but it's it's a little socially healthy yeah to have that practice a little bit yeah it's poison but fuck it because it uh, brings people closer together <laughs> um you know what it reminds me we're of in southern california literally being outside is poison yeah, so what are you gonna do about it that's true you're breathing in smog and you're taking in boatloads of toxic rays from the sun 
But um, one of the things that I thought was so amazing when I first moved to the UK, and, and I still get amazed by it every single time that I'm, I'm here for the transition from winter to, uh, winter to spring, is that because it's often gray and rainy and cold in this region of the world, when it is a sunny day, everybody stops and they don't work as much as they do. And if they're in university, they're kind of like, well, I'm going to take some time off. And if they work in an office, they're like, hey, at lunch break, why don't we take an extra half hour and let's go sit in the sun together. And then very often what you see is as soon as work is done or as soon as they're able to break away from university or as soon as they're able to just get out of their house, so often people congregate at the pubs. And then all the pubs, not all the pubs, many of the pubs have what are called beer gardens here. And a beer garden is basically just an outdoor patio with like some grass and some benches and things like that. But people congregate en masse to these areas. And then they sit on the lawn and people are just sitting outside and they're drinking cider and drinking beer together. And it is this beautiful communal thing that uh, I agree with you, man. I, I love the idea of kind of br public drinking together to build social, uh, build society up and stuff like that. And I don't know. I love that shit. Yeah, I mean, we're both in Southern California and then we... We went to school in the UK and we both found that really just attractive, right? Mm -hmm. The entire pub culture. Not all of it is, obviously. There's lots of, you know, negative things about it and the stereotypes are often true. Yeah. But just the idea, it's almost like a churchly communal thing. It's almost a replacement in many ways for the the local parish yeah. in that you go there and you don't just go for 20 minutes to have a beer. You go for two or three hours yeah. and you shoot the shit and you buy a round for everybody. Um, and you don't really get drunk. You can't with yeah. the really heavy beers and over that many hours. Yeah. So the point of it's more just to have stimulating conversation just for its own sake. Yeah, you know, one of the things I, I noticed when I first moved over too, and I think about this quite often, I feel like British people, in my experience, tend to be more conversant. Now, that doesn't mean that they're as jolly and as, like in Southern California, everyone just seems to like like each other, whether it's bullshit or not. You just like say hi to strangers and shit like that. Whereas here, they, you know, they're That's a little- That's just bit, you, bro. Oh, maybe it's just me. Oh shit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but here, here people, you know, they're a little bit more, they, they keep to themselves, they're a little bit more reserved. But when you're in that environment, in that pub environment, people have conversations. And it isn't like- it is when I go out, at least, in Newport Beach or in Hollywood or something like that. Um, I do get this when I'm in Chicago or in New York, but not so much in Southern California. I feel like the bar culture isn't as much centered around conversation, whereas the pub culture in the UK is much more about let's talk about things. And even though it isn't always about like politics and serious shit, it isn't, it isn't also exclusively superficial. And I feel like there's a big difference there. And, and like I said, you do get that more in like Chicago and in New York. And, and I'm sure you get it in other areas as well. But I feel like in my experience, the bar culture and the pu uh, club culture in Southern California, it doesn't have that level of conversation that it has in the UK. And I love that. I love that about the pub culture here. I'm, I'm picking up the subtext, I think. And um, I'll kind of, kind of conclude it with this. Los Angeles, stop playing fucking loud, terrible music so I can't hear anything else. Yes. In your bars yes, and please. clubs. Yes, please. It's ridiculous. We are human beings who can converse with one another. Language is the gift God gave us <laughs> that no other animal gets to have. Why are you stifling it? Yes. I like it. Boom. Oktoberfest. Get your lederhosen's out. Talk to people. Drink booze in public. <laughs> Masturbate in public. Is that part of Oktoberfest too? It should be. Germans are too prudish, I feel like. They are very much though. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, sick. Well, now we are going to throw it to Michael Burns, who is going to do the segment This Week in Hip Hop. Michael, what you got for us this week? Hey, what is up, worldwide podcast internet? This is Michael Burns. This is This Week in Hip Hop. This is on Al's at Dawn. Nice to have you here. Um, so to get right into it and to build off what the fellows were talking about, biggest release of this week pretty obviously is Danny Brown's atrocity exposition. Um, good record. I think, a, I think a really good record. In fact, uh, it's a weird one though. I think I've had, I don't want to say a hard time processing the album, but I definitely think it doesn't fit neatly in, into any certain box, which is a good thing. So, I mean, the best thing about it for me is just that reminder that 
Danny Brown, you know, he often gets credit for just being a really wild dude. Um, and when you think of him, you think of that high pitched voice he's often rapping in and various um, acts of insanity he's gotten up to uh, in his days. But when you listen to the record, you're reminded of something that's really important is that he's a really good rapper and really lyrically sound and still has, uh, you know, an important place in his music for just bars. And you can get caught up in that sometimes with some of the wild production and some of the content, but a really good rapper. And it's nice to have someone that still takes lyrics uh, that importantly putting out records that are getting listened to this much. So in terms of content on this record, it is typical Danny Brown which just means real fucking dark. Um, Tales of nights that we have probably not had. I'm making some assumptions about you, listener, but I'm assuming that when you listen to the first few tracks on that record, you're not thinking like, oh yeah, I've been there. Um, But really brutal in that sense. And I think the record, both production-wise and content-wise, I felt like it was like a shock to the senses. And someone made this comment, online apologies that i can't remember who it is but just to be honest this isn't my insight but someone had said that it was really hard to listen to anything else after listening to that record uh because it's so unique and so intense and puts you in such a weird zone and this person had said the only thing that they could think to listen to after atrocity exhibition was more danny brown which in a sense is a good thing that he sort of created that lane where he has such a unique sound um in another sense though it's one of those albums that I don't know how often I'm going to go back to that. And I don't know how much I'll dip into that album. It's something that I think in a certain mood, listening to straight on as one unified piece is really important. It's really just solid, but I just don't know how much I'm going to dip in and out of the record, if that makes sense. Uh, And definitely this is a really boring for me. The strong points are the opening track. uh, And then really though, the song with Earl sweatshirt and Kendrick, any person that can get, Earl and Kendrick on the same album. Whew. Uh, it was a good one. And Earl, of course, doing that thing where it sounds like he just woke up from a stone nap and started mumbling. And by the end of it, he is just devastatingly good lyrically. So, uh, but yeah, at this point, you've probably listened to Atrocity Exhibition. So you don't care what I think about it. You probably like it. But if you disagree, let me know. Uh, the other release that came out this week that I imagine went under a lot of radars. Sorry if I'm making assumptions is Lice 2. And Lice 2 is the follow-up to Lice. And Lice was the first project, an EP, uh, from Homeboy Sandman and Aesop Rock, uh, their dual project. I don't know about you, uh, but I think I spent a lot of years of my life very obsessed with Aesop Rock, just as being one of the best technical rappers who has ever held a microphone in his hand. And I think I might have mentioned this to you all before. Maybe I didn't. Um, But Homeboy Sandman is probably my favorite just pure like lyrical rapper of the past five or six years or something like that. So them getting together is really great. I don't know about you, but the first time I heard they were doing something together, it struck me as a little bit odd, but damn, it works really well together. Uh, you kind of have, kind of have, you know, Aesop Rock as being the peak of a kind of technically sound art rap. And then Homeboy Sandman's whole style is sort of a creative reinterpretation of peak New York lyricism, but it goes together really well. Um, it's an EP. You can get it for free on the Stones Throw website. Uh, some really good tracks. The opening track, Zilch, I think is insanely good. The beat starts off kind of reminding me of like Illmatic era large professor production. I think you'll hear that when you get the little xylophone sample in there. Uh, really, really strong. There's a track called Oatmeal Cookies, which is produced by Aesop Rock. Uh, it's really good, really straightforward, really lyrical. And then Mud, a track on that as well. Uh, has this really dope guitar loop on the track. Lyrically, it's really good. And it's basically just back and forth sparring between two of the best gentlemen to currently rhyme words together while holding microphones and wearing hats. I say that because they both tend to wear hats a lot. Uh, But this makes me think as well, this Lice thing and the Homeboy Sandman and Aesop Rock thing, uh, with a little question I had from the dude, the master, the legend, uh, Liam O'Donnell via the internet this week, in which he was talking about, you know, what happened to the backpack rap scene? What happened to this era where there was a kind of robust alternative indie rap scene? And yeah, and I was thinking about that in relation to these dudes, because obviously Aesop Rock was one of the 
kind of leaders of alternative rap, backpack rap, whatever it was for a while. He kind of faded out and has had this really cool renaissance recently. Uh, and it's dope to see someone in his 40s who's still rapping that well. But part of me thinks that something's changed in independent rap and backpack pack rap with the shift away from like record stores and small independent venues towards people finding everything online. Uh, I remember being really young and going to a record store in Orlando where I lived and as like a 14 year old boy asking a guy that worked there if they had uh, the Lyricist Lounge compilation. If you don't know what that is, don't ask me. Uh, and this dude just looking at me with a puzzled grin and being like, you know, what do you know about Lyricist Lounge? But via that, I ended up getting to know this guy, getting to know some other people that liked underground hip hop in the community, finding out a bunch of, about a bunch of dope shit. Uh, and I feel like even though the internet gives us a lot of connectivity, it doesn't allow us to build community in the same way. So I wonder if that is affected sort of backpack rap and independent rap. But I do think there is an interesting wave of people who, who are kind of successful independent rappers that, that are kind of backpack rap, rappers. So I think of like Open Mike Eagle as someone with this kind of modern interpretation of art rap. He's a Chicago guy, but is based in California. Obviously, Homeboy Sandman is someone who has just been committed to strong East Coast lyricism and someone who, for whatever reason, I still think has not gotten the credit he's deserved. Um, and I also think of Odyssey as well. Um, I think of Odyssey, uh, you know, Diamond District, Mellow Music Group. But it seems like there's these little pockets of independent rap artists who are still holding that lane down, but there's still not that much of a robust scene. Although I do think that maybe cities themselves still have these scenes. I can't speak to where I live now because it's England. But uh, when I was in Baltimore, really good underground kind of backpacky scene there. One dude in particular who has since left Baltimore. Um, my man, Kane Mayfield, who's one of the strongest rappers I've ever seen rap. Uh, you should check him out. But I wonder if that sort of backpack independent scene has become something that's more localized because the internet is populated by teenagers and maybe teenagers don't like that sort of stuff. I don't know. I'm starting to sound like a cranky old man. I'm rambling a little bit, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, I switched up the Twitter handle. So if you want to get at me, it's at Mick underscore O underscore Broin. But you could also just search for Big Body Stress, the username, and find me on there. I'll catch you all soon. Don't do anything dumb this week. If you do it dumb, do it big. Peace. Here I go. All right. Thanks for that, Mike. That little uh, rant on... Uh, was that even a rant? Did you qualify that as a rant? It was a very uplifting rant. Yeah, okay. It was more of a pop. What's the positive version of a rant? A diatribe is still like negative connotation, right? Uh, what's, uh, when, what's, you know, in church, when they... When they like uplift you, they edify you. What's that called? When they when they give you a word, you know, when they when they speak. like a benediction. Yeah, there you go, the benediction. Okay, well that benediction about uh, backpack rap that doesn't sound right. But anyway, yeah, it's not benediction because benediction oh, is where you like go with the spirit and the Lord and have a wonderful week or some shit like that. Yeah, it's like an encouraging word or whatever, right? Yeah. That pontificating on backpack rap. I thought that was really interesting because I was thinking about my own sort of buildings Roman like early coming into adulthood experience with music. And for me, there was a, a indie record shop in Glendale, California, hmm. called, uh, it's called Music, dude, I don't even remember the name of it. Oh. I can't believe that. I can picture it in my head, but I can't remember the name of it. And it was in Glendale, and it was, hilariously enough, right next door to a Tower Records, which was like hmm. the devil, right? Yeah. And this place was right next door, and it was just, it was super small, like a very small one-bedroom apartment, maybe 500 square feet hmm. altogether, and wall-to-wall just cds and there's two guys that worked there they were probably in their mid-20s and i was maybe 14 or 15 i had my first job first little bit of disposable income mm -hmm. and i went there every single saturday and just asked them to give me records that were awesome hmm. and then they talk about it and they'd argue over you know oh, this band which is the best record that he should get because he's only got a certain amount of money to spend and i just went home with you know five or six records every weekend that's so funny and uh that's the way I found out about my favorite band of all time, Mr. Bungle, hmm. through these guys. So I owe them quite a bit. That's crazy. And people don't have that anymore. No. They don't have that like mentor, mentee, organic thing that happens. Dude, I was hanging with my pops and my stepmom a few, what, about a month and a half ago, something like that. And we were in the city of Orange in Southern California. Have you ever been to the Orange, the old the old city of Orange with like the Orange Circle right by Chapman University? Yeah, yeah. It's really cool, right? It's like this old 1950s 
town. The town just really hasn't changed much since then. So they've got a lot of antique shops and whatnot. And we were walking around in one of the antique shops and they had all these old albums, uh, like proper vinyl albums. And my dad got a little nostalgic for a second and was talking about how when he was younger, every week what he would do when he would get paid is he would take his money and he and his buddies would go to the record store. And what they would do is they would just flip through the records, right? And they would just buy them. And I could tell that that was something, it was such a huge part of his life and such a huge part of his molding experience. And then I was thinking about myself and I kind of had something similar because we would go to, you know, we would go to record stores, which don't exist anymore. But there was something kind of lovely about that that is gone because now it's just you just sit in your fucking isolated room and with your Cheeto fingers and flip through the iTunes store, right? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just go on YouTube and you try stuff out that you hear is good and either you like it or you don't like it. There's yeah. no, like, risk involved. If you don't like it, whatever. I mean, if you like it, you still get it for free. Yeah, exactly. Not, 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 that, I, not that I do that, but <laughs> yeah, you yeah, could. Yeah. One could do in, that. In theory, in theory. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I hear you, man. That's funny. Well, sick. Well, I'm stoked because now I have – I didn't even know what the fuck backpack, backpack rap was. I mean – I knew about underground hip hop, but now I feel like I've got a whole genre that I need to introduce myself to this week. So once again, thank you, Michael. Homework. Grazie. Uh, all right. So cool. Thank you. That is us. We are done for the week. Please head over to Twitter and Instagram and hit us up. Owls underscore at underscore Dawn. Uh, we're going to be doing an episode at some point in the future based on listener questions or thoughts or things like that. We've already gotten a couple of, of things on Instagram. So head over, leave us a note, hit us up on Twitter. Let us know if there's anything you think we should talk about or that you have questions about philosophically, politically, culturally, or just completely random and esoterically. I'm down with that shit. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And please leave us five star reviews on uh, iTunes. If you get a chance, leave a review. Gets the podcast out. We really appreciate it. Das Vidania, Americana.